people connected to this community, neither the math nor the physics one. A lot coming from the you know, Kant math literature. A lot of these classification of phases, so this is all about classifying phases of uh, matter, uh, comes from uh, these papers and gap phases, gapless phases, with, without fermions with non-invertible symmetries, without non-invertible symmetries, and continuum and lattice. So there's a huge literature, and what basically our goal was is to sort of find some framework that could perhaps deal with all of these kind of uh, questions. Anyway, let, let me sort of set the scene. What is actually the question we're trying to generalize? So in physics, there's sort of this famous Landau paradigm which says a continuous second order phase transition is a symmetry breaking transition. So usually the symmetry is a group G and I'll sort of focus in all of what I'm saying is the groups are usually finite groups and the categories are semi simple. So I always have finitely many generators of my symmetries. Um, <clears throat> so G is a symmetry group and it can be spontaneously broken to a subgroup H and then there'll be G mod H many vacua and the broken symmetry acts on these. So that's all the canonical picture. And when you take, for example, G equals to Z2, uh, this is basically there are two phases. One is a trivial phase where you have a single vacuum and you act with a symmetry and act trivially. And that's sort of <coughs> the case when H is Z2. And then there's the spontaneously broken phase when I have two vacua and uh, the, the broken symmetry acts between these. It's, of course, very well known from sort of standard symmetry breaking uh, considerations. And <clears throat> if I look at this in a two-dimensional system, essentially these two things would be gap phases, so the topological phases, and the second one is essentially characterized by a non-trivial vacuum expectation value for an order parameter that's charged. So it's a charged operator that gets a non-trivial vacuum expectation value. And now I can ask if there's sort of a transition between these two phases. And indeed, if I look at sort of this phase diagram, there is a critical model, which is the easing conform field theory. So it's a gapless theory that sits between these. So you could think of this as the, the phase transition between this tri trivial and the spontaneously broken symmetry phase. <clears throat> so this seems sort of abstract. There's a very concrete way of thinking about this, which in all these considerations is helpful, also when we generalize the types of symmetries we're looking at, which is the easing sort of spin chain. So it's a very simple Hamiltonian model in quantum mechanics. It's a spin model with a Hilbert space that's C2, and we have L sites, so just spin a half up and down spins, L sites, and there's a nearest neighbor Hamiltonian. Z and X are just Pauli matrices. There's a nearest neighbor ZZ interaction, and then there's a coupling strength G, and then X. So this is a transverse field easing model, and that realizes precisely this transition I just talked about. So there's a Z2 symmetry, and that's the symmetry we're looking at. That's the one that sort of gets broken or is unbroken in the various phases, and that just flips the spins. So we have all spins up or down, and we can flip the spins. And <clears throat> so the first sort of ground state, where with the first phase with two ground states is we have all spins up or all spins down. That's the so-called ordered phase. And the spin flip just maps between these two phases. That's the case when G is actually just set to zero. And this is the dominant term here. If the second term dominates, then in fact, the ground state preserves the Z2 symmetry. And then they get a disordered phase. And indeed, now at G equals to 1, we get this critical model, which is the easing CFT, central charge equals to 1 half. And this is this sort of mini phase space of this spin model. So that just realizes this transition that we just talked about. This model is also useful, not just to illustrate so this simple symmetry breaking paradigm, but it also is useful actually for another angle, uh, another sort of uh, direction that this talk will be going, which is that this also has a, an interesting duality symmetry between the G less and G bigger than one uh, regions. If I map x to zz and zz to x, this basically corresponds to g goes to 1 over g, and that actually maps this region to here. And of course, at g goes to 1, this becomes a symmetry. And this sort of symmetry basically is a symmetry of the easing CFT. And if you compute, if you square the symmetry, 
Uh, in, in fact, it's a squares to one plus the Z2 transformation. And this is this sort of Kramer-Zani duality symmetry, and it's realized in the spin model very concretely. You should keep in mind that in essentially all of the models I'll discuss later that are more complicated with non-invertible symmetries, uh, you will always have a simple spin model like this. And if you'd like to know more about those, I'm happy to discuss them afterwards. Anyway, so this segues, this, this sort of uh, symmetry at this uh, critical point segues nicely into the second part of the title, which is not just the Landau paradigm, but also the Landau paradigm in the context of non-invertible symmetries. So in the last 10 years, we've sort of generalized the concept of global symmetries in physics. Essentially, you're starting with this seminal paper here by Gayota, Kapustin, and Seibig, and Willett in 2014. And the idea is topological defects in physics should be identified with symmetries. And the most recent generalization is to the so-called non-invertible, or in this context here in this room, I think I can fairly certainly use the word categorical without half the room running away, so categorical symmetries. So these are the simplest examples are really these fusion category symmetries. And most of my talk will be about fusion categories. So <clears throat> just to very so roughly explain what, what the structure is, is you compose two symmetry generators, and what you get is not just another symmetry generator that is sort of like a group composition law, but you get a sum of generators, usually with non-negative integer multiplicities. A bit more, there's a bit more structure, and I'll explain it in a moment, but there's a long history in two-dimensional quantum field theories about fusion category symmetries, but what's sort of in the last few years been really exciting is that, starting in 2021, is that such symmetries can also exist in higher dimensions. So you can construct quantum field theories with these sort of non-invertible composition laws, and in fact, their symmetries form higher fusion categories, generalizing this notion of uh, fusion categories. So <clears throat> just <clears throat> to be, be clear what a fusion category symmetry is, so you have a two-dimensional theory, and in a two-dimensional theory, all you essentially have, apart from a strange minus one form symmetries, are zero form symmetries. So these are just standard uh, sort of zero form uh, symmetries as we know them, but they can now have these uh, non-invertible uh, compositions. So they are generated by lines. I always have these D1 subscripts uh, for, to indicate the dimension of these topological defects, the topological lines, and they will have some comp they have morphisms between them. So there's a morphism, which is now basically topological point operator, and the fusion is given in terms of the general fusion rule given here, and I can also depict this in terms of a picture like this. In addition, there can be sort of associativity conditions, which come from sort of <clears throat> how you package, say, the composition of three lines, and these, can, these, these coefficients here will satisfy additional consistency conditions. So this is all the structure that, that forms a fusion category. The ones I will study are extremely simple. It'll be the easing category and the representation category of a group. So let's just recap what this easing fusion category symmetry is. That's the one that was realized at the critical point of this easing chain. So it has a Z2 generator and this non-invertible generator N. <clears throat> so eta squares to one, but n squares to one plus eta. And so this is kramers vanya duality symmetry. Another simple fusion category symmetry is coming, or a huge class is coming from the uh, representation categories of uh, non-abelian groups. So if you take a finite group G and you look at the representations of it and you associate the representations to the lines, and now you look at the composition, and the composition, the fusion is given in terms of the tensor product decomposition, then that also gives a fusion category. So the simplest finite group that's non abelian is S3, and so that the representations of S3 will form such a, an example of a fusion category. So here are the irreps, which are sort of the simple lines, they generated, or the trivial representation, the sign representation, and then also two-dimensional representation, I'll call E. And now this sign representation, of course, squares to one. That's just sort of the signature of the permutation. But E actually squares two, and now this is just a tensor product decomposition of this two-dimensional representation into the irreps. And that's, again, a non-invertible fusion. So these two examples will be useful to keep in mind for the rest of the talk. <clears throat> 
I will not talk too much about the higher dimensional incarnations of non-inversible symmetries, but let, just to give you an overview, I think there were talks by Matt and by others about uh, categorical symmetries, but just to give you a quick idea of what type of constructions they are. The first one is very much similar to the one that appeared in this easing chain. You have a duality image, you have a duality that acts on a quantum filter in this case in four dimensions, and a particular point in the parameter space of this quantum field theory, this actually becomes a symmetry, and then this duality actually generates a, or represents a zero form symmetry that's non invertible. So there's a sort of four dimensional Kramer's Vanier duality defect. The other defects, which are condensation defects, which come from gauging a higher form symmetry on not the full space time, but a subspace. And then there are also gaugings of outer automorphisms when you have an outer automorphism of your gauge algebra, for example, and then you get naturally non-invertible symmetries because only certain combinations of symmetry generators, the original theory, are actually invariant. And if you square the, this one form symmetry generator, you get automatically a sum of other things. This just to highlight if that's the kind of constructions you can think about in higher dimensions, and that sort of has ignited this, this whole field. Then what the structure that governs these type of symmetries is this higher fusion category symmetry. Um, so in addition to uh, lines, you will generically have p-form symmetry generators, so topological defects that will act on p-dimensional extended operators, and in d-dimensions, they are of dimension d minus p minus 1. And so in d-dimensions, you would have a d minus 1 fusion category symmetry, which has topological defects of dimension d minus 1, d minus 2, all the way until 0. And all of them will have a composition, and they will also uh, have certain associativity and compatibility conditions. So for a three-dimensional quantum field theory, you would have surfaces, lines. Lines can also be bet junctions between these surfaces and points. And so in two dimensions, the nice thing is that, in fact, uh, there's up to gauge equivalent a classification of these uh, types of two fusion categories. Okay, I will not talk too much about these things, but one really essential bit which is true for both the two-dimensional but also the higher-dimensional non-invertible symmetries is how it, they act on um, charges. So in a standard group-like symmetry, you would have, um, say, an operator and a zero-form symmetry, and you could measure the representation or the charge by surrounding the operator uh, with a topological defect of co-dimension one. For non-invertible symmetries, the structure is different. And I'll sort of illustrate this for you in this example of the easing category, but this extends also to higher dimensions. And this is this is sort of a hallmark of how non-invertible symmetries are represented. So if I call a Q charge, so a Q-dimensional defect in the representation of non-invertible symmetry, you can study these in two dimensions using structures called tube algebras and the lasso action and so on. But effectively, this is this beautiful argument in Froelich, Fuchs, Wunkel, and Schweiger, which goes back many, many years. Um, just look at the easing category. You have these lines. This is the non-invertible lines. Now we can act on a local operator. So you can insert, say, for example, the spin operator in the easing CFT and pass this topological defect through sigma. So this topological, I can sort of bend this out, then use the fusion of n squared, and then actually at the end of this, I get another local operator, but now attached to this eta line. So in fact, this action of the non-invertible symmetry is always between a genuine operator, which is sort of not attached to a topological defect, and a non-genuine operator that's attached to a topological defect. So this also percolates throughout the whole representation theory of these um, generalized non invertible symmetries. Okay, so that's the setting. So you should think of these as a new class of symmetries, in particular in higher dimensions. And now you can ask how we generalize the, the Landau paradigm that we spoke about in the Z2 example to such symmetries. When I have a fusion category symmetry, a higher fusion category symmetry, can we now, for example, explain transitions, phase transitions that cannot be explained by, say, a group-like symmetry. So in condensed matter, people are very much into understanding such beyond Landau transitions. And so one hope is 
these symmetries may actually help us to explain at least some of them. And we'll see many examples where the symmetry being non-invertible is essential. So to actually develop this framework, we'll have to actually see, well, first of all, what are the gapped phases? So this is like the SSB phase or the, the trivial phase or maybe some SPT phase. What are the order parameters? So these will be generalized charges. And then also how do we study these transitions between, say, a gapped phase, another gapped phase of a given symmetry. So there should be some gap left or some uh, scale invariant theory sitting in the middle. That's what we'll try, we'll try to sort of develop. I'll focus mostly on two-dimensional theories or two-dimensional phases, but this can also be extended to higher dimensions, and I'm happy to talk about this. So one essential piece in this study to make this a systematic sort of framework is the so-called symmetry TFT. And the symmetry TFT was sort of, it, it, it's known in the mass literature in the context of to write Vero theories and two-dimensional theories, the three-dimensional topological field theory. Essentially, the way to think about it is, is you're given a qu quantum field theory with some finite symmetry S, and then the symmetry topological field theory corresponds to gauging that symmetry, but not in D dimensions, but in D plus one dimensions. So you have a TQFT in this sort of D, D plus one dimensional uh, space, and the, the actual physical theory is D dimensional. And the statement is, if you put the symmetry TFT into a certain configuration with, on an interval with certain boundary conditions, you will get back, after the interval compactification, the original theory T. So there are many, so this, this uh, terminology, that this is a sandwich, and in fact, it also is sort of related to a, the square of a quiche, comes from uh, these gentlemen here. I think one of them is in the audience. Uh, this is a slightly pe peculiar terminology, but we will return to this because there are generalizations of this when we study gapless phases. So you should think of this as, you have two boundaries of the sim TFT, and those determine what the theory um, and its symmetries are in D dimensions. Examples of the sim TFT is for a P-form symmetry, a BLN, it's just a BF theory, and it's a Dijkhoff written theory for, say, a ZN um, P-form symmetry. It has a background field, BN, BP, BP plus one, and it's dual, and there should be a D here. I'm really sorry, and the degrees don't count. I'm really sorry about this. It's, it's and, but then also in, in, in two dimensions, for example, the three-dimensional TQFT are the two R zero theories. The topological defects of the symmetry TFT will be the main players because they will actually correspond to the generalized charges. They will determine for us the order parameters, the types of boundary conditions. And so in fact, in a given a symmetry S, a categorical symmetry, they are forming what's called the Drinfeld center of this category. So the two boundaries are what the, the SIM TFT really is sort of uh, really importantly depending on. One thing is that <clears throat> on the left hand side we have the symmetry boundary and that's essentially where all the symmetry aspects of the theory live. So for example the topological defects that will generate the symmetry will live on this boundary of, the, of this interval. And in, in terms of boundary conditions, these are topological boundary conditions for this D plus one dimensional theory, and they're classified in general terms by Lagrangians inside this Drinfeld center. On the right hand side, you have the physical boundary. That doesn't need to be a topological boundary condition, and it, it sort of captures all of the non topological aspects of the theory, the dynamics, and usually the charges will be things that stretch between these two boundaries and we'll talk to the physical and the symmetry boundary. <coughs> and indeed, after the interval compactification, you get the theory together with the action of the symmetry. So the point of this is that you can separate symmetry aspects from non-symmetry aspects of the theory. And we'll see that this framework also allows us to classify all the gapped phases. How do I recover the symmetry? As I already said this, this comes from topological defects that have a projection to the symmetry boundary, so these are the, uh, the Neumann boundary conditions, and the ones that are mutually non-local with them, they're essentially part of this Lagrangian algebra that uh, defines the uh, 
boundary condition. So this is basically how you recover the symmetry. And the charges come from this linking action. So if you have a topological defect that ends on both of these boundaries, and there's a dual sort of D that links with these in the bulk. So in the same TFT, these, these, these topological defects um, have a non-trivial linking. And in two dimensions, they would be, so it's a three-dimensional topological order in the bulk. And this would be just the, the, the linking between two topological lines. Then this type of configuration, this will become, if this projects and becomes a symmetry generator, then this calculates precisely the symmetry action on a charge, which comes from the compactification of this line that has Neumann directly boundary conditions on both, uh, and um, <clears throat> computed in this sort of sim TFT picture. So a charge is coming from a linking in the sim TFT. And finally, there are also these non-genuine operators that are attached to, the sim to some topological defect, and they come from these lines that sort of have these L-shaped configurations. You can also get these types of things, and in this way, we will see the action of the non-invertible symmetries in this context. Okay, so the SIMTFT for finite groups is already interesting, particularly if G is non-abelian. I'd like to actually go through what the structure of this, this uh, uh, Gentile center of this uh, uh, fusion category is. So the, group-like symmetries in two dimensions. They're just forming this fusion category back G. They're just graded G vector spaces, G graded vector spaces. And the lines in the center are labeled by conjugacy classes and representations of the stabilizers of norm and G in this conjugacy class. So that actually is all the topological defects in the SIMTFT. And <clears throat> of course, the question is now, uh, how do I, from this, this structure, extract out, for example, uh, the boundary condition that gives me back the group-like symmetry? Or how do I extract, say, the symmetry where, for example, I have gauged that symmetry? So the SIM-TFT is, in fact, completely blind to, uh, to, to start with as to which type of global, like, gauged form of the symmetry you've taken. And that's actually given in terms of these Lagrangian algebras. So these are with the gap boundary conditions. So these are algebras in this, this uh, center where I take linear combinations of these lines with coefficients, and they have to satisfy certain consistency conditions. And the, the fact that they're Lagrangian means that they're of sort of maximal dimension. So you're picking a maximal set of mutually local lines, essentially, and they form this, this Lagrangian algebra, and they can then end on the symmetry boundary, and the ones that are mutually non-local with them they will become the symmetry generators. In the case of S3, which is the simple example we talked about before, the group is just the same direct product Z3, Z2. The irreps are the trivial, the sign, and the E representation. And then we can write out the conjugacy classes, the representations of the conjugacy classes. And then this is the Drinfeld center of S3, or back S3. It has these lines here. And now one can ask, what are actually these gap boundary conditions? And indeed, there are these four gap boundary conditions, and two of them are the ones that we've encountered before. This one here will give rise to the VEC S3 symmetry, so it's just a group-like symmetry, and this one will give rise to the REP S3 symmetry, which is the non-invertible symmetry. And then there are two others, which are sort of, uh, I will discuss them later, they come from um, particular gaugings of these, for example, this one is REP S3 mod Z2. But there's a full list of gap boundaries, and now you'll ask, why am I telling you all this? Well, okay, so there's a, another piece that, that sort of is essential is how actually the symmetries then act. So we can get these non-trivial actions on, on, of symmetries on charges by looking at this Drinfeld center and the linking inside there. So for example, for S3, basically these ones are just the representations of S3. So these are the untwisted charges when they end on both boundaries and these are the twisted sector operators. And in the rep S3, it's a bit more complicated, but the crucial thing is what I explained at the beginning, you get these combinations of genuine and non-genuine operators sitting in the same multiplets of the symmetry, and that also comes out from this Drinfeld center uh, uh, computation. So for example, there's a local operator, an operator O plus, and this non-genuine operator O minus, 
And in fact, we can calculate the action of the symmetry, and it maps this operator to this plus some phase and the non genuine one, and vice versa. Okay. So, just to summarize, maybe the SIM TFT basically has the topological defects are determinist charges. The gauge in actually corresponds to changing the boundary conditions. And if two symmetries are related by gauging, then in fact they have the same SIM TFT. At least this is true in the two dimensional uh, setting. This is, construction exists for any higher fusion category also. And concretely, for example, for two fusion category, uh, where you have a group-like symmetry, maybe with an anomaly, that has a concrete decomposition in terms of uh, some simpler objects in terms of just two wrap categories of destabilizers. And of course, there's recently been work also here at CESA about extending this whole uh, structure of the SIM-TFT to continuous symmetries, uh, where then you can also include, for example, uh, higher groups uh, with continuous uh, factors, etc. Okay, so why am I telling you all about these gap boundary conditions? And in fact, this comes from the fact that this will lead us now to how we will classify these uh, symmetric gapped phases. So in the same TFT, I said, well, this physical boundary condition usually is chosen not to be a topological one, because usually you're looking at a quantum field theory, and it's not necessarily a topological theory. But if you're interested in symmetric gapped phases, then in fact, you would like to pick also the right boundary here to be topological. So in fact, we said that those topological boundary conditions are given in terms of these Lagrangians in the Drinfeld center. So in fact, once I've fixed the symmetry on the left, I can now cycle through all the Lagrangians, and then the collapse of this will give us TQFTs with symmetries S. And the types of things that can happen are essentially exactly similar to the group case. There'll be sort of spontaneous symmetry breaking phases. So this is this case here. And they can be characterized in terms of the Lagrangian that characterizes the symmetry and the symmetry Lagrangian actually having more than one element inside. If there's only one element, it means there's a single vacuum, then in fact, this is what's called a symmetry protected topological phase. So in fact, the Lagrangians, its properties, is sort of encoding the types of gap phases we get, and also the, the order parameters, et cetera, and the number of vacua, which is precisely the number of sort of lines that stretch between both of these boundaries. So just to be concrete, we will repeat this now for a case we know extremely well, which is, again, the group case. But there are some surprises as you go to the gapless uh, setting. So I just want to repeat this very briefly. The, <clears throat> the case of the Z4 group-like symmetry, which is totally a Landau kind of symmetry breaking setup, but it's useful to see it in the SIM-TFT picture. So we expect the subgroups and then potentially some phases. In this case, there's no real phase. So essentially, we're expecting there to be the Z4, the dual Z4 symmetry, and then something that's a gauging of a Z2. So those are the phases we expect. The same TFT is the Z4 Dijkhoff written theory, now written correctly. This is the form of the written theory here. And the topological defects, these are the Drinfeld center sort of generators. These are these holonomies of B and C. And they have these lines in the center, have these relations here, so that actually E to the 4 and M to the 4 is 1. But we can have these combinations of lines. And E and M, of course, braid non trivially because of this BF coupling. The Lagrangians are these three Lagrangians. So these can just be computed from these general conditions. And the one that gives this of Z4 symmetry is the first one here. So I fix that to be the symmetry. And now I ask, what are the gap phases? So the gap phases are slot in one of these three on the right-hand side and calculate what the properties of that SIM-TFT setup is. So we fix the symmetry boundary to be the one for Z4. And then we can, for example, look at the same boundary condition to be the physical one. So now every line in this Lagrangian, so E1, E, E squared, and E cubed, they can all end. We get four non-trivial order parameters. And in fact, this is, means there are four vacua here. And this is precisely Z4 spontaneous broken symmetry phase. There's the other, the dual sort of boundary condition, which is the Neumann boundary condition where I just have one m, m squared, m cubed. 
In this case, I just have the identity line, so I get the single vacuum, so that's a trivial phase. And finally, there's one which is sort of a mixed boundary condition, and that actually has two vacua. So that's precisely what we expected from the Landau sort of general analysis, and this is sort of the SIM TFT picture of it. But the nice thing is this we can apply also for, say, non-invertible symmetries. So for example, for easing, the SIM TFT is e the double of easing, so easing box, easing bar. Um, there's some topological lines, I will not bore you with the details, but there's a single Lagrangian algebra. So I would get only one choice, and I get three vacua. And in fact, we can also, because we know the linking of these topological lines with these lines that are the order parameters, we can see how the symmetry acts. So the Z2 will act trivially on one vacuum, and then exchanges these. So there's basically a trivial Z2 and a SSB a Z2 phase, but the non-invertible symmetry will act between these non-trivially. So this is sort of how the easing gap phase, this easing uh, SSB phase, so to speak, um, is realized in this, this context of this SIM TFT, and we can extract the action of the symmetry and the order parameters. So for rep S3, we already wrote down all these Lagrangians, there are four Lagrangians, and there are these symmetry, symmetric phases. There's a trivial phase, a Z2 SSB phase, a rep Z, S, S3 mod Z2 SSB, and the full spontaneously broken symmetry phase. So we'll see that this actually is very reminiscent of the action of uh, you know, what we saw in the, in the easing case here. But in fact, there's a crucial difference that in this case, actually, there are relative Euler terms. So in fact, this phase can be distinguished from the phase from this easing. OK, so for gap phases, the SIM TFT gives you a complete classification of the phases by just classifying Lagrangians and then looking at these uh, configurations. But what's also interesting is to ask what happens to these gapless uh, phases, and so how do we consider transitions? So we have a gap phase and another one, and now can we actually have a sort of critical point between these, and can we study its properties and what type of CFTs these are? So one observation is if we have two gap phases in 1 plus 1D, we said these are Lagrangians of, this, of the Drinfeld center, um, then there's a sort of a natural guess that this object here will be determined in terms of an algebra that's, again, a set of lines that will end on, on some, some defect, and that's the intersection of these two Lagrangians. But this will generally, of course, be non-maximal. So the question is, in fact, what, what it, what's the physics of this? How, how does this actually help us characterize this? And this is actually the moment when you need to extend the SIM TFT picture, so from a, a sandwich we now need to extend it to a club sandwich. So we have uh, three slices of bread with filling on both sides. And when you open it up, which is the structure that was, I think, dubbed the, the, the quiche, now it becomes a club quiche because you have sort of a sandwich plus a quiche on top of it. Anyway, why is this relevant? So the key is these algebras that are non-maximal, in fact, will give rise to interfaces between topological orders. So for example, I will start with a symmetry S. That's the symmetry I'm interested in. And then such, a con such an algebra will, that's non-maximal will define interface to another topological order, usually a reduced topological order. And so this configuration here will in fact determine for us these gapless phase transitions. If you just look at this picture, I can also collapse this side here. And then it's saying to this topological order, this actually characterizes boundary conditions that are asymmetric. And they may not be sort of irreducible boundary conditions, but usually there are some sum of boundary conditions. So the, this is not an irreducible boundary condition. So we'll see many examples of that. Uh, but it'll be an asymmetric boundary condition to a topological order that's not necessarily the center of it. So in fact, if A is a Lagrangian, right, if this, this, this interface here is given in terms of uh, Lagrangian, then in fact, oops, then you, you're giving just that the Z prime is just trivial, and so you just get the gap phases. But if this interface is determined by a non-maximal algebra, then in fact this, this Z prime is a reduced order, and in fact it'll be the center of a smaller symmetry S prime, a reduced symmetry S prime. 
Okay, so this is sort of the picture, the club sandwich is then the closure of that, where I start with some, this is the simplicity of the symmetry. I have a non-maximal algebra, so I end certain, a subset of lines, and then essentially there's a reduced topological order, and then I can slot in the B physical, and this object will have a symmetry that is S. But in fact, this physical theory here may not be so sort of initially, a this theory actually may only have a symmetry S prime, um, and in this way we'll get actually a theory that has a symmetry S. So it's a way of bootstrapping from starting with a symmetry, a smaller symmetry, a gapless phase that has this larger symmetry S. So in quantum matter, this goes under the name of Kennedy Tasaki transformations from an S prime symmetric to an S symmetric uh, theory. So just to, yes? It's, it, the interface is, uh, well, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's given in terms of um, just a non-maximal thing, so there'll be some operators on it. We'll see what, what the interface will look like. In the, in the I see, okay. But it's all uh, topological, I think. I think so, yes. Right, so, for example, I start with a theory that has S prime symmetry and I can construct just the sim TFT. So think of this as a smaller symmetry. There's a sim TFT for this. Then I can slot in this club quiche that connected to the sim TFT of S. And then this sort of compactification on this side here will give us now an asymmetric theory out of this construction. So I essentially feed in a transition for a smaller symmetry and get a KT transformed larger symmetric solution. Okay, so let's see this, and this is interesting already for the Z4 case. Uh, so we will see that if we look at these non-maximal algebras, uh, already in the Z4 case we get some interesting structures. So for example, in this case, the, uh, the condensable algebra, so all these sets of lines that are consistently can be ended and there's, it's sort of consistent under fusion, um, is the identity line, this one here, one plus E squared, one plus M squared, one plus e squared, m squared. So you can see these are not maximal. These are not the Lagrangian lines. The, this club quiche says there is a sim TFT for Z4, but then certain lines will end. So in this case, e squared ends, but the other lines will just propagate through, and then there'll be some reduced topological order. In this case, it's Z2. In this other case, it's also Z2, but in this case, it's Z2 omega. So this is Z2 with an anomaly the double simian theory. So it, this is just a way of bookkeeping how the condensing of lines or the ending of certain lines that are not maximal lead to interfaces between topological orders. And now we can, of course, take one of these configurations, so for example, this club keys here, and then slot in and then ask what is actually the interpretation when we compactify this, this uh, Z4 interval we get a reduced boundary condition for the Z2 topological order. And in fact, the Z4 still is acting on this. That was the whole point of that. So you get essentially a, a sort of a configuration of a Z2 symmetric theory with the Z4 acting between them in this way. You get a Z4 symmetric gapless theory as soon as you've slotted in on the right-hand side now a Z2 symmetric gapless theory. So for example, the Z2 one, of course, naturally is easing CFT. So for an example of the Z4 symmetric uh, gapless phase is easing plus easing with the Z4 acting as an exchange between these two and the Z2 subgroup acting inside the easing as the standard easing symmetry. So that's the transition between the Z4 and Z2 SSB phases. And then there's also the transition between the Z4 trivial and Z2 SSB, which is this easing model with the action of Okay, so that's for invertible, and now the nice thing is we can do the same for these non-invertible symmetries, because the whole formalism is completely blind to whether you've started with an invertible, non-invertible one. You can repeat the whole thing, and now, for example, in this case, you get reduced topological orders that are Z3, so the initial transition will be something like a three-state POTS model, so that's giving you sort of this initial transition, and then one can use that, for example, to construct uh, the, uh, the associated um, gapless phase for rep S3. Uh, there's also a, a one from uh, this one here, from this example here, which is 
similar to this easing plus easing, but again with some relative Euler terms. You get an e easing plus easing transition with the non-invertible symmetry acting. Uh, okay. All of this can be put together into sort of a phase diagram, sort of a cartoon phase diagram. So we have the gap phases for rep S3 with the four gap phases. There's all these vacua and the action of the symmetry. The red is the non-invertible symmetry. The blue is the Z2. And now between these, here there's a Z3 uh, uh, POTS model, easing model, and then here you have the easing plus easing. And this it can be sort of understood both in terms of the continuum analysis using the SIM TFT, but also in these papers um, by, by our uh, group and, and also by Chatterjee, Axel, and Wen, there's a lattice model with rep S3 symmetry, or this phase diagram can be realized by just starting with a lattice model and tuning parameters, uh, which realizes this rep S3 symmetry. So that really has underpinning in some you know, uh, lattice computation. And so that's an extremely nice sort of story. There's also some multi-critical point, which I think Gwen and collaborators try to pin down, and that remains a little bit of a question, which corresponds to um, <clears throat> basically the algebra one in this case. Okay, so the roadmap to get phases, all phases basically for a, for a symmetry S is you construct a SIM TFT, you construct the center, classify all the condensable algebras, the maximal ones give you the uh, gap phases and the non-maximal ones will give you gapless phases and then there'll be some uh, transitions between these which are essentially characterized by intersections of Lagrangians. And all these condensable algebras, in fact, have a structure which is a partial order. So, in fact, you can also put them into what's called a Hasse diagram. So, for example, Z4, these were our Lagrangians. And then they, these, these non-maximal ones, so there are sub-algebras in these two Lagrangians and so on. And then we can pick. So, this is simply an analysis in the SIM TFT. We haven't committed to any symmetry yet. If you pick a symmetry, it means you pick out one of these Lagrangians to be the symmetry one, and then each one of these boxes come to life as a particular phase. It's a spontaneous symmetry breaking phase or an SPT phase or SSB phase. So in this diagram, I want to sort of explain a little bit the types of phases that there are. So we already talked about these SPT phases, which are these symmetry protected phases, a single vacuum, and you can't deform to the trivial theory without breaking the symmetry. Um, there are also analogs of that in the gapless world. So these are these gapless SPT phases, and they have the same property that the Lagrangian and this algebra intersect in one. But then there are also interesting ones, which essentially are these, these sort of IGSPT, so they're intrinsically gapless, and they have sort of, uh, you know, the criticality is protected here by the symmetry. You can't actually deform this without breaking the symmetry to an SPT phase. So these actually never connect to SPT phases in the gap world, only potential to SSB phases. And then it's sort of an analog in the world of SSB phases, so the gapless SSB phases. So in, in this sense, you can now map out for any symmetry category. You pick the symmetry category in the center, and then classify these algebras, and you get these type of diagrams. And I was saying, so for example, for, this, for the center of rep S3, uh, this is the, the Hasse diagram. You can pick, for example, the symmetry S3, and then determine what all these different algebras correspond to. But you can also pick a different boundary condition and look at the rep S3 phases, and then get sort of this diagram, and I, the phases have a different interpretation. So, for example, in this case here, right, this will be an SSB. This will be an SSB phase, but in this case, this is an SPT phase, etc. So it's a sort of gauge invariant way of characterizing all the, you know, the, the possible phases, and then you put properties onto them once you picked the symmetry Lagrangian. And if you have very powerful students, they will also give it to you for rep D8. Uh, this is sort of Allison and Dan's work. And there's actually, this is not just sort of entertainment, but there's a really interesting thing from the point of view of studying gapless phases. There's an intrinsically gapless SPT phase for this rep D8 symmetry, which is sort of the first non-invertible 
such a faith. Uh, in okay, so am I running out of time? Two, four, minutes. four minutes. Okay, so maybe, so just a few general words about how to characterize these phases. Essentially, there's sort of the gap versus gap line. So there's an energy gap in the spectrum. Is it bigger than zero? Zero. But there's also sort of a SPT-ness. So how much of this is there a symmetry gap? And what I mean by symmetry gap is basically the symmetry gap is bigger than all the charges of S can be realized in this phase. And so there are some, S, some charges that are actually confined. And so all phases should be labeled by both what the symmetry gap and the actual energy gap is, and then you get this classification of uh, gapless, gapped, SPT, SSB, and so on. Okay, so this is the table. Uh, so the roadmap is very clear, and basically you carry out this, this program for your favorite symmetry category, and uh, this should give you a characterization of all the phases that are possible. Now, you might ask, are there actual physical systems that realize these types of symmetries? And the nice thing is that for fusion category symmetries, there is uh, something called the anion chain. So it's a, a, a spin chain that actually has the fusion category symmetry built in. So it's symmetric under that given fusion category symmetry. And this type of analysis can be carried out in parallel for any fusion category symmetry for the anion chain. So you can also construct anion chain as uh, Arsen, Fendley, Mong, and others. And so the anion chain has some drawbacks in terms of the uh, properties that's maybe not realized on a single tensor product Hilbert space, but in this case of the rep D8 that I, I gave you this, uh, this phase diagram, you can realize it on a tensor product Hilbert space. And one can feed in sort of the general continuum analysis property. So I can feed in the algebra, the symmetry, that <clears throat> provides a chain that has realizes that specific phase. Okay, so conclusions, open questions. <laughs> um, so I focused in this talk mostly on two-dimensional uh, phases with fusion category symmetry. Um, there's many sort of interesting open questions uh, to extend this to higher fusion categories, particular to 3D and to 4D. In 3D, of course, there's this interesting thing how one could connect to the classification of 3D topological order in this context. And also, what is the meaning, the physical meaning of higher dimensional GSPT, IGSPT, et cetera, phases? Uh, so there are some examples of GSPTs in four dimensions that Dumitrescu and Sin studied, um, and Thomas gave a really nice talk at Strings last week. So certainly these things will have some interesting insights in higher dimensions. And finally, also, it would be interesting to extend all of this to uh, the study of not necessarily finitely many symmetry generators to so non-semi-simple categories, also continuous symmetries, so that we can build these into also these symmetry considerations. Um, so I should also mention, if you are interested in this field, there are two meetings. One is in Oxford in August, uh, where there'll be sort of condensed matter theorists and high energy theorists and mathematicians will come together. And then there's a long program at KITP. Uh, again, mass physics and condensed, or high energy physics and condensed matter physics. So you're welcome to please come to these meetings. If you're interested. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you very much for this nice talk. Are there questions? There. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to understand the general picture. So, so in this club sandwich picture, you have yep. right. So you have, I guess you have a Lagrangian subalgebra on the leftmost uh, that boundary. That fixes the symmetry. Yes. Okay. Great. So if I choose a Lagrangian algebra. I mean, sorry, if I, interface. sorry, yes, if I choose a Lagrangian algebra on the interface, which... Then you have a, a, this reduced order is just trivial, so you get a gapped phase, right? So the, the interface will be one to the trivial topological order. Because you end all the lines, 
right? The maximal set of lines that will end, so there's basically, this is all the maximum set you could condense. But I can choose exactly the same Lagrangian algebra as the leftmost one, or choose some other Lagrangian algebra. You get an SSB phase. Oh, I see, okay. Right, so the, this was this analysis. You have a gap phase, uh, this is, for example, this one is the same as this one, then you get an SSB phase. But these are both of these are gap phases, uh, gap boundaries. And if I choose a different Lagrangian algebra, that will then be... Then you uh, will get a different gap phase. This was this one, this is this one, this is this one. So as you go through all the Lagrangians, you go through all the possible gap phases with that symmetry. Z4, SSB, Z2, SSB, and then this is a, 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 a trivial phase. Okay, thanks. And then if you have a non-maximal one, you get an interface. That's sort of the, the description of the gap plus phases. Are there more questions? Uh, sorry. Um, there are uh, some chain framework uh, for uh, capture this um, phase transition from the holographic uh, point of view. You, you can realize uh, the three and the four dimensional uh, theories in, yeah. in holographic. Uh, yeah, so that framework. would be interesting. I think we, we don't quite know yet enough about the transitions, at least from this sort of, for non-invertible symmetries, right, you're asking. Uh, so I think we first need to understand the general formalism. But certainly holography is, the, the, the same TFT has many similarities to holography, right? It's just a sort of topological sector of the holographic, you know, reduced action. Um, so that seems like a way you could maybe approach it once you've understood sort of the general framework, for sure. Yes, okay. I see another question. Uh, so this type of discussion can be done for both for on the lattice and yes. in two series. And on the lattice, there are some subtleties. For example, there is a translations needs to be involved and in the fusion categories. No, I mean, this is if you want to realize a symmetry yes. um, on a tensor product Hilbert space, then you need to also involve lattice translation. So okay. Nati, Shu Hang, and Sahant have this easing chain, right, symmetric yes. thing. That's then if you yes. want to have tensor product Hilbert space, then there's translation that comes into this. Mm -hmm. However, this anion chain is a setup where you can just realize the symmetry without any of these additional, the, the cost that you might have to pay is that it's not a tensor product Hilbert space. I see, but I see, then so. it still gives a way to characterize these phases in this context. I see, okay. Okay, so if you don't care about the factorization That's of the Hilbert right. space, then the story is That's parallel. Right. I see. Great, thank you. Are there more questions? I don't currently see any, so let us thank uh, Sakura again. Thank you.